Can you see it? Living in a safe place created for you by your hands. Surrounded by people who look like you. Free to just be who you are unadulterated. Free of not having to make others feel comfortable or having to assimilate to be like the oppressor's offspring so you could possibly be accepted. And not having to worry about what they do when they feel uncomfortable. Separation isn't a bad word. I'll be back. Welcome back, subscribers, and those who are not subscribed, welcome too. And if you haven't done so already, please press the notification bell so you will be alerted when I upload new content. Let's get into this. They said it perfectly, and they are two individual men. One is Malcolm X. This is how he broke it down about the difference between segregation and separation. Check this out. This new type of black man, he doesn't want integration. He wants separation. Not segregation, separation. To him, segregation means that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. Well, those who call themselves superiors. A segregated community is a Negro community. But the white community, though it's all white, is never called a segregated community it's a separate community in the white community the white man controls the economy his own economy his own politics his own everything that's his community but at the same time while the negro lives in a separate community it's a segregated community which means it's regulated from the outside by outsiders the white man has all of the businesses in the negro community he runs the politics of the negro community he controls all the civic organizations in the negro community this is a segregated community what does that sound like sound like old plantation just modernized right Check out what this man says about being a separatist, and he is proud of it. I believe in separation and independence. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed to say that I am a separatist. I have a right to be a separatist. I have a right to want freedom and independence. I have a right to want a, not a party of my own, but a nation of my own. I'm a separatist. I want a flag of our own. I want some land of our own. I want our own rules, our own regulations. You can't, if you have any sense, and if you are honest with yourself, it doesn't matter your ethnicity or race, nothing those two men say can be disputed. Nothing. All the tragedy and chaos and horrific things we have experienced in this country ain't no one world we don't have a right to want to be separated to to mesh together to grow together to to learn one another without any molestation without any interference without any infiltration by any person or group that's pretending to be for us but all they're doing is sowing seeds of um, strife confusion discord that's what they've done throughout the history in this um in this country towards us anytime we come together as a unit someone is always a sign to come in and sow discord 
is documented. The FBI documented it. The FBI did it. When it came to our um, organizations that were erected to help us, the FBI would always infiltrate someone in who looked like us to bring about confusion, and eventually the organization would collapse. It would, it would implode from within. So before I go deeper into this content, I would like to reiterate something I have been saying multiple times, or I have said or asked multiple times. Here we go. Like, I keep asking a question, what did integration do for our people? No one has answered that question. Can anyone tell me the benefits of integration? How did it benefit us as a whole? Next question, why would you want to live around someone who has shown you, your parents, grandparents, great parents, nothing but disrespect? Disrespect, disregard, abandonment, cruelty on a level that I can't even process. Why? I wouldn't even want to talk to a person, sit next to a person, work with a person, go to school with a person, ride on a bus with a person who has treated me the way their ancestors treated our ancestors and they continue to perpetuate today. Okay, let's get on with the content. It began during the winter of 1865. As the the Union Army marched through Georgia, a shadow army of former slaves, freed but jobless and homeless, followed. By some accounts, they numbered up to 4,000. The Union soldiers used some of them as laborers, but had no way to feed or clothe the vast majority. They were known as contraband. As the soldiers approached Savannah, they prepared to cross Ebenezer Creek. The Union commander placed his platoon bridge down and marched his army across. The freedmen following also started across But then the Union commander ordered the bridge pulled up, causing some of the freemen to drown. Word of this was carried back to Washington via the newspaper, and President Lincoln sent Edwin Stanton down to investigate. Sherman expressed annoyance at the logistical problem the freemen posed and asked, What do these Negroes want? Stanton told Sherman to ask them, Sherman was the, he was some kind of, he was the general or something over the um, Union Army. So this guy was actually annoyed that the free, jobless black fighters, soldiers, were following his platoon. So annoyed that he wouldn't even let them cross his platoon behind his Union Army, and a lot of them drowned. This, this is how the men were treated who helped these fight that war that didn't have anything to do with their freedom. It was more, it, it was like probably 30% freedom for slaves and then 70%, you know, the fight was 70% for slaves to be, or people to be, remain in bondage. Let's continue. Sherman requested a meeting And the local churches sent 20 black men, lay and clergy, to meet with him at the home of a local merchant. The black men, some former slaves, some not, elected Garrison Frazier, a Baptist minister, as their leader. Frazier had been a slave for 60 years and was a minister in a Baptist church where both free and where both free and slave blacks worshipped. He had bought his freedom just as the war started. Now here he was a 68-year-old man facing a general of the Union Army. He was facing Sherman, the one who was annoyed and wanted to know what Negroes wanted. Sherman began by testing Frazier's mettle. He asked whether Frazier understood the reason for the war. See, already assuming that this Negress was dumb as a box of rocks, so let me... (laughs) Let me see what this. Let me see if he even know what one, two, three, A, B, C is. 
that's the mentality they still have today. Just so, so rude and so disrespectful. Let's continue. Frazier answered clearly in the affirmative. When asked whether they prefer to live separately or among whites, Frazier replied, I would prefer to live by ourselves for there's a prejudice against us that would not permit for our people prosperity and harmony. He and his fellows understood that salvation lay in owning their own land and having independence. And I keep stressing, you see why they methodically kept land out of our hands. Wealth is in land. And in its inherent it's an inheritance that you can pass on through your family. Let's continue. For four days later, Sherman issued field order number 15. It stated the islands from Charleston south, the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea and the country bordering the St. John's River, Florida, are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the president of the United States. Did you hear that? There was 30 miles of abandoned rice fields. But when they talked about giving it to the black folks, all of a sudden a new interest was sparked in the abandoned rice fields. Let's continue. Sherman ordered Bridge Brig Jen Rufus Saxton to distribute to the head of each black family not more than 40 acres of tillable land and to give the freemen any animals no longer useful to the army it was this order that generated the slogan 40 acres and a mule the pastor of Bryan Baptist Church in Savannah took 1,000 black families and tried the homestead Skidway Island one of the sea islands in an attempt to create a black owned state under black control his efforts were short lived as the terms of the land distribution remained ambiguous was the government giving the freed people the acreage outright or leasing it regardless by June 1865 approximately 40,000 ex-slaves had settled on about 400,000 acres of land in the designated area but that September, after Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson, a Tennessean sympathetic to the South, pardoned former Confederates. He ordered the land the freemen were homesteading restored to their owners. Riots ensued as federal troops forcefully evacuated blacks from the land they thought they had earned rightfully with the fruit of their unpaid labor. That is still unpaid today in 2024. For African Americans, it was the first bitter taste of the promised land of freedom. And I can't believe that after that happened, after Johnson, that, that should have been a violation of some kind of constitution, federal executive order. That should have been a major violation. But you see how people don't fight for black folks? And then here we, this happened in 1865. So here we are, 2024. Nobody ever went back and reclaimed that land or, or um, petitioned, well, however you do it, step to the president, current presidents, presidents after that, and demand that that land be given back to the freed slaves. This kept them in destitute, destitution, disenfranchised, discombobulated. This kept him in a state of frenzy and, and hyper anxiety and frustration and aggression and anger beyond your mind's comprehension and frustration and just deliriousness because you did him so wrong and continue to do him wrong to this day. And now you bring him, it was a clip that they, um, played of um the, with the interview that um cat williams had with joe rogan i'm inserted right now check this out 
What What do you mean the immigrants are getting a check and we're putting them up in places that wha- what? <laughs> you mean in the homeless people's face? Right in the homeless people's faces. Like, right? Let us show you what we could have done. Right. Wow. Crazy. That's not okay. As a and they don't care that they're doing it in all of our faces. Every citizen's face, they are doing this. It's like they're so arrogant and prideful with it. Like, you better not break the law, but we're going to break the law, right? And you're fa- I don't understand why more people aren't angry. That these politicians are literally breaking the law, endangering this whole nation, and it's all, at the end of the day, is only for a stupid vote. They are trying to bring these illegal people over here to vote for them. Why aren't people going to jail? Why aren't these people going to jail for willfully violating the Constitution and state and federal laws? <laughs> Let's continue. Okay, let me ask the question, and I want you to answer without your feelings. The question is, were blacks better off as a people under segregation? In a wide-ranging telephone interview with Tom Troy, a reporter for the Toledo Blade in February, I was asked if blacks were better off as a people under segregation. This guy, was this um, black man professional, was being interviewed. He said, as a race, we were better off economically, educationally, and socially. We had our own teachers who lived among us in our neighborhoods who attended our churches. We knew them and they knew us and our parents. We had a relationship, not because of segregation, but separation. Pre-integration crime rates in our communities were lower. And you got to ask your question, why? Why were crime rates lower in black communities pre-integration? Let's continue. Although our schools were not perfect, our children learned more and they were more disciplined when we had our own code of ethics supported by our own parent teacher association. See, there's a way that we are and there's a way that they are. And you look at the school system today, who runs it? And look at our children, look what's going on. You think if we had our own community with our own educational system, you think this mess will be going on? If we had our own police department, you need to think think about it. Let's go on. Policemen, resource officers were never seen at our schools. They were not needed. Our parents provided all the discipline that was needed. I'm against racial segregation. It is the imposition of the will of a stronger race on the will of a weaker one. That is wrong. And we aren't weak people. What he mean is, you know, the resources, when it came to the resources, we lacked it. And that was because of disenfranchisement. Things that were intentionally done to keep resources out of our communities out of our pockets out of our bank accounts those who have bank accounts and for those ignorant people that talk about why black folks don't have bank accounts go research what they did to the freeman bureau how they robbed those people they all came together put their money in a a bank account that was provided by the freedmen bureau and their money was taken from them Millions, this is like, I don't know if it was a million or a little bit more than a million, a million dollars. It was taken from black folks. So after that, they stopped trusting banking institutions. There's always something, a reason behind why we do things in this country and why we don't do things in this country. All it takes is a, a desire to know before you start running your mouth. Like, well, didn't Kevin, Kevin Hart say something about black folks not having, um, bank accounts it was just some ignorant stuff i heard and when you're in the entertainment industry you are privy to information that a lot of us in the gym pop aren't and then you come and speak reckless with no 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 repercussions and no shame 
Let's continue. Jesus. That is wrong. Separation, on the other hand, is the free choice of one group to separate from the other for the good of the group. It does not deny the rights and privileges of any other group, which has been done to us. Segregation. Let's continue. Chinatown is controlled by Chinese. They live there. They run it. They have their own schools, stores, churches, and see Jesus through the slanted eyes of their own culture. They have what whites have, only smaller. Many blacks, and I am one of them, think that separation is far better than entire integration, assimilation, or segregation. The white and black churches are separated but not segregated. Whites are not denied admissions to black churches and neither are blacks denied admissions to white churches. However, blacks who attend white churches don't run them. And few whites who attend black churches don't run them. There are obvious cultural differences that are quickly recognized and respected by both churches. When blacks get ready to leave the service to go to the restroom or just leave, they will usually stand, raise their right index finger, bow, and slowly walk out. Does anyone know the reason behind the one finger gesture? Let's hear their reasons for the one finger gesture. First question, when somebody is sitting in church, and you see them raise one finger as they're leaving like this. What does that one finger mean? Excuse me, I need to go to the restroom. <laughs> or, excuse me, I need to step out for a moment. Yes, they are correct. But what's missing is the root behind the one finger hall pass. A historian explained, During the slavery days, when the masters took their slaves with them to public gatherings, the slaves would always sit in the balcony. When the slave had to go to the bathroom or wanted to be excused for any reason, they would hold their hand up and keep it up until their master acknowledged that they saw their hand and gave them permission to leave. In other words, excused them to leave. After the slave was given permission to leave, they would hold up one finger as they were leaving to inform anyone that saw them leave that they had been excused. So it means my master has excused. Whites, on the other hand, just get up and leave any assembly at any time. Blacks who attend white churches find themselves raising their right index finger, bowing and slowly walking out. Whites, whether they attend a white church or black church, just get up and leave. That's that mentality they have. <laughs> they are superior. They don't have to do all that. <laughs> Let's continue. The Chinese are not integrated and don't ask for it. They have their own Chinatown. The Vietnamese are not integrated and they don't ask for it. They have their own little Hanoi. Cubans are not integrated and don't ask for it. They have their own little Havana. These groups build their own communities, have their own stores, restaurants, and churches. They see Jesus through the yes of their own cultures. They have their own economy, select their own politicians, elect them, and then collect from them. What I'm going to say is even Martin Luther King had the dignity to admit that he led his people into shark infested waters. Listen to what Harry Belafonte said Martin Luther King shared with him. Last thing Dr. King said to me before he was murdered. Martin said, you know, I sit here deeply concerned that I suspect we're leading our nation on an integration trip that has us integrating into a burning house. I can respect him for being man enough to admit that he made a mistake. And he didn't even get the chance or opportunity to rectify that mistake, to correct it. How many so-called politicians that are were voted in positions to help the black community would be so bold and honest and admit their mistakes or admit their shortcomings or admit that once they get into these positions, once they're elected into these positions, they really can't do anything for the black community that's why black folks have been participating in this 
political system for hundreds of years and still haven't gotten anywhere. You have immigrants coming over here, illegal and legal coming over here, appearing to supersede the people who have strong roots in this country and helped mainly build this country. I'm kind of like at a loss for words because it's just like, you know, when you have you ever thought about how long 400 years is to be treated the same way, never changed. Matter of fact, has gotten worse. Do you even have the mental capacity to process how long 400 years is and how long these people can retain hatred in their heart? towards people who haven't done anything to them. It's like the audacity of you to hate someone who looks like me. And we haven't done anything to you. Our ancestors haven't done anything to you. We who have come after our ancestors haven't done anything to you. But you have done a whole mess of wicked, abominable things to us. And you have the nerves to say you hate me. You dislike me? (laughs) When you think about it, it's actually ludicrous. It's like somebody harmed you, did wrong to you, and then say they don't like you. Like, if you don't get your demonically possessed ass out of my face with the quickness, for real. Yes, I did say ass. Ass is in the Bible. So chill out. It's not that serious. That's about all I have to say in regards to this this video. I and I have put a for the past few years, I have really thought about integration and separation and how you know we have lived we have lived among these people who have oppressed whose ancestors have oppressed our people and they perpetuated what their ancestors did because if they didn't we still wouldn't be talking about it and dealing with it today the unfairness the history of unfairness and brutality afflicted upon our people you know when when i think about it it's like why why continue to live around people who have shown you so much hatred So much hatred where they would snatch your father and grandfather out of their house just for stepping up being a man and speaking up or whatever. Whatever pissed these people off. They woke up on the wrong side of the bed and and wanted to lynch a negress. You know, it didn't even have to be a reason for them to take your father or grandfather's life. But they had so much hatred in their heart that they will take, they took your father, mother, grandmother, sister, uncle life and most of the times nine times out of ten and it was for no reason and then they sit back and ask the question why do black folks hate them so much no the question is why do you hate us so much is it because you see something in us you know you don't have and it wasn't you weren't blessed to have it that if you didn't take from us steal from us imitate us rob us intellectually and physically that you wouldn't have what you have today you hate us because we might remind you of how much you're lacking (laughs) yep well thank you for your time and attention i'm about to wrap this up i hope you um enjoyed the video the information that we're putting out and um if you subscribe thank you so much if you haven't subscribed please consider subscribing and check out the rest of the videos i'm sure you will find something that um is interesting to you and with that being said i will see you in the next video thank you so much peace